morning, and the Lord be with you. It is my great joy to once again stand before you on this, the seventh Sunday of Easter, the last Sunday in the Easter season, which means I get to say to you one more time, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. We are the people of resurrection. We continue to celebrate that miracle, that reality that God brings into our lives each and every day as his children, as his people, we continue to look forward as things seemingly are getting better and better with each passing day. And we are, as I say, looking forward to bigger, to better, to more, knowing that God has great plans for his people here in this place and through us, his people throughout the world. We have a great worship service plan for you today, which begins with our confession and absolution. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, imploring him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Almighty God, our Maker and Redeemer, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean, and that we have sinned against you by thought, word, and deed. Wherefore, we flee for refuge to your infinite mercy, seeking and imploring your grace for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. O most merciful God, who has given your only begotten Son to die for us, have mercy upon us, and for Jesus' sake, grant us forgiveness of all our sins, and by your Holy Spirit, Increase in us true knowledge of you and of your will and true obedience to your word to the end that by your grace we may come to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, has had mercy upon us and has given his only Son, Jesus Christ, to die for us and for Jesus' sake forgives us all of our sins. I announce the grace of God and declare to you the forgiveness of all of your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We join together and sing our opening hymn, The Head That Once Was Crowned With Thorns. Mighty 
Lord be with you and also with you. Let us pray. O King of glory, Lord of hosts, uplifted in triumph far above all heavens, leave us not without consolation, but send us the spirit of truth whom you promised from the Father. For you live and reign with him and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The first reading is from Acts, chapter 1, verses 12 through 26. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying. Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James. All these, with one accord, were devoting themselves to prayer, together with the women, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. In those days, Peter stood up among the brothers. The company of persons was in all about 120, and said, Brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in this ministry. Now this man bought a field with the reward of his wickedness, and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle, and all his bowels gushed out. And it became known to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that the field was called in their own language, a kaldama, that is, field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, may his camp become desolate and let, there be no, let no one dwell in it, and let another take his office. So one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. And they put forward two, Joseph called Barsabbas, who was also called Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, You, Lord, who knows the hearts of all, Show which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We read Psalm 1 responsively. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, 
nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Our epistle reading is from 1 John, the fifth chapter, beginning at the ninth verse. If we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater. For this is the testimony of God that he has borne concerning his Son. Whoever believes in the Son of God has the testimony in himself. Whoever does not believe in God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony that God has borne concerning his son. And this is the testimony, that God gave us eternal life, and this life is in his son. Whoever has the son has life. Whoever does not have the son of God does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. And this is the confidence that we have towards him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests that we have asked of him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 24th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Then Jesus said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you. But stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Then he led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy, and were continually in the temple, blessing God. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Good morning, boys and girls. Good morning, grown-ups. Welcome back on another fabulous Sunday morning. I'm so happy to be with you today. So friends, I want to start off by talking about a symbol. And maybe you've seen it before. Maybe you've seen it on your computer or even your telephone. And maybe you call it the star key. But there's actually a name for it. And it's called an asterisk. And we use it sometimes in sentences. And when we put it maybe at the end of a sentence, it kind of means, but it means that the sentence is true, but maybe there's a condition on the sentence. Let me give you an example. Maybe your parents have a rule that you can't have ice cream during the week, but if it's your birthday or your sibling's birthday, then they'll make an exception. And in that case, maybe the rule would look something like this. No ice cream during the week, but if it's your birthday or your sibling's birthday, they'll make an exception. And there we have our asterisk, right? 
And boys and girls, there's a reason I'm talking about this today. This is not an English grammar class. There's no quiz at the end. But I bring this up because I want us to be thinking about the Bible and not how much we see asterisks in the Bible, but how we don't see them much at all. We don't really see them ever, right? And in the Bible, we hear about rules that God gives to us, rules that he wants us to follow, not about eating ice cream during the week, some that are a little bit more serious, right? So we hear that we should follow the Ten Commandments. We hear that we should listen to and follow Jesus. And this one we heard last week, right? To love each other as Jesus has loved us. But boys and girls, where are the asterisks? Where are the stars? There are none. Because when we hear these rules in the Bible, there are no exceptions. There are no conditions. There are no but. When Jesus tells us to follow him and listen to him, he means always. When God told us to follow the Ten Commandments, he means all of them. And when Jesus told us to love one another as he has loved us, he means everyone. And boys and girls, I know this is hard. These are really hard rules to follow. But there are no exceptions. Jesus didn't say, love one another sometimes, or love the people that look like you and sound like you and think like you. There's no exception. There's no asterisk to any of these rules. And the reason that we follow these rules is because God tells us to. And Jesus tells us to. And the way that we can show Jesus that we love him is by following these rules. So unfortunately, there's no way that we can get out of these. But the way that we show Jesus that we love him and we're grateful for him is by following these rules, following the Ten Commandments, following Jesus, and treating one another, loving one another, as Jesus has loved us. No if and or buts about it. Amen? All right, friends, let's fold our hands and bow our heads and repeat after me. Dear Jesus, thank you for loving us. Thank you for teaching us. Thank you for protecting us. Help us to remember to love one another as you have loved us with no conditions, with no conditions. And, no and no exceptions. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. Amen. Great job, friends. We miss you and we're praying for you and we can't wait to see you so soon. Our service continues now with our hymn of the day.
So this past Thursday night, the high school youth group gathered here at the church. They gathered in my backyard, actually. The weather was absolutely perfect, so we met out there, and we had a wonderful, wonderful time. We played a game called Cornhole. If you don't know what that game is, maybe that's worth a Google. Check that out. It's a lot of fun if you have a chance to play that. We took the football out. We threw that around a little bit. And we spent some time talking. And we have an amazing group of high school seniors this year. We've really been missing our high school group. We've really been missing our seniors this year. And as we were talking, eventually, inevitably, the conversation went to, where are you headed next year? And when are you going? And I couldn't believe the answers. One of our students is going to the Coast Guard Academy. And he's actually leaving July 15th. And I couldn't believe that. Well, that's too soon. We've missed so much time. We only have so much time left. And then the other kids started telling me where they were going. And the same thing. They're leaving in late July and early August. And it just feels too soon. And I wish we had more time together as our youth group. But we're thankful for the time that we have. Departures have been on my mind a lot lately. Truth be told, recently it feels like most every week, someone from the church will contact me and say, Pastor Browning, I hate to tell you this, but we're moving. Over the past year, we've learned that I don't need to go into the office. I can work from home. I can work virtually. And if we can live somewhere a little bit less expensive, that's a good opportunity for us. And I say, okay, and I wish them well, and I smile as best I can, but departures are never easy. Talked about departures on Thursday at the youth group. And of course, Thursday, for another reason, commemorates a significant departure in the church. Perhaps the most significant departure that we observe as the church. Thursday, of course, was 40 days after Easter. And if you're keeping track at home, you may know that 40 days after Easter, we observe the ascension. That was the day that Jesus, who had risen from the dead and appeared to his disciples risen in various instances as recorded in the New Testament, 40 days later, he ascended into heaven. He left this earth. He departed from this world. And of course, as you may also know, we remember that moment, that ascension, every single time we gather as the people of God, whether it's in person or virtually at our services. In the Apostles' Creed, we always say, we believe he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. A significant moment, a major Departure. We're talking about Jesus himself. And for the past 2,000 years, Christians like us have been trying to wrap our brains around what this means and how to understand this and how to explain this and how to answer the hard questions that inevitably come our way. Questions I get asked all the time. Questions I wonder myself on various occasions. And the question comes in many shapes, many sizes, many forms, but basically it could be summarized like this. Where is Jesus now? 
Where is Jesus now? When there's plagues and pandemics and health crises, where is Jesus now? When there's problems, violence, conflict, and war, where is Jesus now? When tragedy strikes locally, globally, where is Jesus now? When we're hurting, we're sad, we're feeling alone, and lost, and frustrated, where is Jesus now? When problems come and the problems feel unfixable, unsolvable, the problems make us feel small and helpless. Where is Jesus to fix this, to stop this, to change this, to help with this? This is part of the human experience, isn't it? Wondering and questioning. Why doesn't God do more? Why doesn't God help with this? Where is Jesus? And it is a hard question to answer. And I will try my very best to answer it for you today. Just to be clear, where is Jesus? We believe he has ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. That's where he is. I've lived on Long Island for the past 18 years now. I consider myself a Long Islander. I consider my wife, who's lived with me these past 18 years, a Long Islander as well. Our children who were born here, we are raising them as Long Islanders. We love living on this island. The thought of living anywhere else to me is literally nauseating. And living here so many years, there's something that people say a lot in this part of the world. You know what that something is? I know a guy. I know a guy. I'm looking to have a new kitchen put in. Well, I know a guy. Let me give you their number. I'm looking for a really special birthday cake for my children. Good news, I know a guy. My daughter plays soccer. I'm looking for a coach to give her extra lessons on the side. I know a guy. I'm looking for somebody to drive me to the airport. I know a guy. Brothers and sisters, friends in Christ, on the topic of life and death, on the topic of what happens when your time on this earth comes to an end, on the topic of heaven itself, I have good news. I know a guy. And so do you. And right now, as we speak, he is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty in heaven itself. He has a place at the table. He has a throne next to the Father. And he is perpetually ensuring that we will not be defined by sin and pettiness and impatience and the conflicts and the smallness that rages in this world, he will ensure that any label in, that this world might put in us is not permanent. We will be defined by him, by his cross, by his empty tomb, by his death, by his resurrection, by his forgiveness, by his perfect ongoing love. And he is in heaven itself right now, linking us to him, to that love, ensuring that nothing can separate us from grace, forgiveness, second chances, life everlasting. That's where Jesus is. 
And Jesus promised us, I am preparing a place just for you in this kingdom, the kingdom that will have no end, no more pain, no more grief, no more tears, no more suffering, no more death, the promise of resurrection. Jesus is laying the groundwork, getting that ready for you right now as we speak, the promise of eternity. That's where he is. But Jesus is Jesus. He is the greatest power in this universe. His love is bigger than death itself. Death could not keep him down, and heaven cannot contain him. Yes, Jesus is in heaven, but Jesus is not just in heaven. He's present with you right now as we speak in these words that you have heard today. The life-giving, life-creating word of God. He speaks that word to you, a word of forgiveness. a word of life, of death, and of resurrection. Jesus Christ has risen from the dead. And because of Jesus, I say to you again, all of your sins are forgiven. Your salvation is complete. You are destined for eternity. That's where Jesus is. He's in those words. He's in the communion meal that we eat every time we gather in person. His body, his blood, forgiveness, life everlasting, so real that you can taste it. So powerful and profound that heaven cannot contain him. It comes right into your life, into your body, into your soul. That's where Jesus is. But that's not all. Jesus made a promise to you and to me and to all of his people through the ages. The words that he spoke moments before he ascended into heaven, as you heard in our gospel reading for today. Behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you. The Holy Spirit. God literally living in you creating your faith, sustaining that faith, giving you hope and trust and love in who Jesus is and what Jesus is and all that Jesus has done for you and does for you right now. Behold, the kingdom of God is within you. And that Holy Spirit inspires you, strengthens you, and opens your eyes to see Jesus in the places we would least expect. Open your eyes. Look for Jesus. It's not always obvious where he is. He doesn't always dwell where we think he would or should. Where is Jesus? He's living in that person who's alone right now, who's hurting, who's sad, who's grieving, who's poor, who needs something, anything, a note, a card, a call, a simple hello, the simple feeling that someone's interested, that someone cares. That's where Jesus is right now calling out to you because Jesus says, whatever you've done, for one of the least of these brothers or sisters of mine, you have done for me. And Jesus is in you. One of the great fallacies perpetuated by humankind is that God isn't doing anything about all of this. God is doing something about all of this, something wonderful, something profound, and that something is you. He calls you to be his ambassador. He calls you to be his hands and feet in this world. And that is significant because brothers and sisters, friends in Christ, do you realize what you are? 
You are a new creation. Forgiven of all of your sins. Rendered eternal by the person, the work, the life, the death, the resurrection, the ongoing presence of Jesus Christ. And you bear the Holy Spirit. God lives in you. Share that God. Make it obvious where Jesus is. In his name, for his sake. Amen. We confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. My friends, once again, I do invite you, if you're in a position to do so right now, consider giving an offering to support the ongoing work of the church here in this place and throughout the world. Instructions on how you can make an online donation are now appearing on the screen. You can also bring or send your donations directly to the church, and I'm happy to discuss this or anything pertaining to our ministries with you at your convenience at any point in the near future. As you consider this, as you pray about this, we sing our offertory. Let us pray for the whole Church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Lord of hosts, your Son, Jesus Christ, our King of glory, now stands with you uplifted in triumph far above the heavens. Continue to reveal his presence to us each day while we await his coming in fullness and give us boldness to share his saving news to all. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious Lord, give us sincere hearts to thank you for the countless blessings that you have bestowed upon us, for our daily bread, our livelihood, and for our friends and family. Sustain us in faith towards you and teach us to welcome and care for one another, serving with all humility and generosity. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Mighty God, sustain the leaders of every nation with your righteousness and abundant mercy. Grant them humility and wisdom to serve with integrity and honor. Bless our president, our governor, and all who serve in public office. Safeguard our military, all police officers, firefighters, and first responders, and continue to support and care for our medical community. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful and loving Father, be the source of peace and restoration for all who are in need of your healing and comfort. Today we pray especially for Arlene Schuller, Dolores John Charles, and Joseph Iamasha. We pray also as well for all those listed on our prayer guide and all those we name before you in our hearts now.
Give ease to their troubled body and minds, and renew them with the overwhelming power of your salvation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious Lord, strengthen your church that we would always set our hope fully on the grace revealed in Christ, with the assurance that Jesus is surely present with us according to his promises. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, we give you thanks that through your Holy Spirit you have appointed us to bear witness to your Son, and that through him you give us forgiveness and eternal life. Continue to unite us in your truth and love until we obtain the salvation promised through Christ, our ascended Lord, in your everlasting kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Amen. And Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us all to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you his everlasting peace. Amen. We conclude with our closing hymn, Thine the Amen, Thine the Praise. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. 
Thanks be to God. God.